It's December 6, 2008. It's Maximize Utility. Today, the fourth and final piece in our history of the U.S. Fed. It will run from about 1987 to the present, but we'll focus on 1987 through 2005 when Alan Greenspan was chairman of the Fed, and then make some comments about the current situation under Ben Bernanke. It's not that I believe that policy is the person, but we want to see, can we discern changes in the economy and then make policy to counteract them? Can we discern when crises exist and make policies that will handle those crises? That's the question. Alan Greenspan became chairman of the Fed in 1987. In a way, he is the most ironic character. He was a libertarian, meaning he didn't think the government should have a role in the economy. He was a member of Ayn Rand's inner circle. But he became perhaps the greatest vindicator of government policy. He was uh, head of the Council of Economic Advisors under the uh, Nixon and Ford administrations, and then he became chairman of the Fed from 1987 through 2005. Can you find a greater example of somebody who supposedly hated Washington but committed so much to Washington-style policy? Now, when he finished his term in 2005, it looked like a very, very successful run of monetary policy. People like Milton Friedman said that Greenspan had done a great job, and arch rivals like Alan Blinder said that he had done a great, great job. What we want to do is look at various episodes from that run and try to see, did policy really work or was it just a strong economy? Now you could do micro-analyze episodes and come up with a hundred different episodes of monetary policy. That's a different kind of analysis. But I want to look at somewhat large sweeps of policies. Greenspan was appointed in August 1987 by President Reagan. I think Greenspan at the time was following Volcker and trying to get inflation down, down to a level in the low single digits, zero, one, two percent. And his first episode was the stock market crash of October 19, 1987. About 20 percent of the stock market wealth disappeared right away. Now this in conventional macroeconomics would cause a great negative wealth effect. People are supposed to consume out of their income, but they also consume a little bit on their wealth. And if the wealth goes way down, it should cause the economy to go down. Now, the Fed announced it would stand ready to make loans to financial institutions, and it also did traditional lowering of the Fed funds rate to trickle through and stimulate the economy. The rate went from 7.25 to 6.5 in January 1988. Now, just a note about the way they lowered rates back then. They didn't tell you exactly how they were doing it, and they didn't do it in discrete amounts like they do today, where they say they're going to do it in 25 basis points, and they try to hit that right away. Anyway, it's hard to say. Did this save the economy? Did this help? Perhaps, perhaps not. The second major episode, and I'm going to take it as an episode 2 and a 2B and run it over a number of years, was the recession in 1990-1991. Now, the Fed had been lowering rates in 1989, and then a recession hit actually in August of 1990, would run through February 1991, and the Fed lowered through that year and into the next year, and 20 lowerings altogether, and most of them were 25 basis points cuts, a couple were 50 basis points back in 1989, it wasn't clear exactly how much they were cutting. Anyway, concurrently, the SNL crisis was happening, and this was the right kind of policy, if you believe in stimulative policy, but it did take a long, long time for the economy to recover. And this would get us to what I call episode 2B, the aftermath of the recession in 1990-91, when it looked like the economy was getting out of the recession from late 1992 to the spring of 1994. The rate was kept at 3. And then Alan Greenspan made a decision in 1994 to raise rates a lot. His idea was that he was trying to fight inflation and or achieve a soft landing to an expansion. Now, people aren't sure exactly what he was really doing. Maybe he was trying to target the... In, the stock market bubble at the time, the stock market in 1994, the Dow Jones had broken through 4,000 and people thought it was really high. Inflation, in fact, at the time wasn't that high. It does go down as an infamous year, at least among mortgage people. In early 1994, rates were low and people were told they could swing a certain mortgage. They'd come back six months later and the rates had gone up so much that they could no longer afford to buy the house they were planning on buying. Let's try to summarize that approximately five-year period. In the early 1990s, we did have a contraction, but then was inflation after the contraction the problem? What about the stock market bubble? Uh, Alan Greenspan later in his career would say that you can't discern and trick bubbles, but it looked like he was trying to do that back then. Uh, what about productivity? Later in the decade, Alan Greenspan would claim that he saw the productivity that would allow us to keep the economy humming along at low rates, but why wasn't the productivity there early in the economy? So that gets me to my question. Should the Fed have even lowered to save the economy and then raised to get the soft landing? Or what if we had 
at some point in the early 1990s just said, oh, the Fed funds rate is now at about 3%. That's something too close to what economists call a neutral rate, a rate that neither stimulates economic growth nor contracts it. What if we had simply set the Fed funds rate at 3% and left it there for all time? Would the economy today in 2008 be any worse off now than it is right now? To summarize monetary policy since about the 1990s to the present and do a good job, we take a lot of time, and I somewhat do a disservice to try to summarize it in four minutes, but here goes. In the latter half of the 1990s, the Fed Fund's target rate was not changed too much. The rate was about 6 in late 1995, and then it was about 5 in late 1998, then there was some tumult in 1998. But Greenspan didn't do much of anything, and supposedly couldn't do his autobiography. He saw the increase in productivity, so he kept the economy going along. He didn't try to fight inflation. And the key thing is, from 1996 to 1999, the U.S. economy grew at about 4% per year each year, 96, 97, 98, 99. The growth was 4%. Now, for those of you who are beginners at macro, 3% is about our norm, and 4% is a lot more than 3. In every one of those years, 96, 97, 98, 99, most professional economists were expecting poor growth, but it turned up a good year every year. That made doing monetary policy really easy. In 1997, it was the Asian crisis. The U.S. Central Bank didn't respond too much. In 1998, there was the Russian bond default and the failure of long-term capital management, the big hedge fund. The Fed did lower a little bit in the fall of that year, and some people say it forestalled a major crisis, but it looked like the economy was pretty strong and those weren't really big events, especially compared to the events of today, 2008. Towards the end of the decade, there was the year 2000 problem, and the Fed made extra liquidity available. It seemed like a relatively harmless thing, but some people contend that was the start of a housing and commodities bubble. The stock market ran up a lot in the 1990s to historic highs by many measures, and it continued to rise up until about March of 2000. Now, the Fed was aware of the stock market bubble, but really didn't do anything to prick it. It was raising rates until about May 2000. Then it faced a different problem. The economy started to turn bad. And in 2001, indeed, we had a recession. It was a mild recession. The Fed lowered. And we had a slow recovery, and then Greenspan would make the case that we had another soft landing. In 2003, the focus changed to fighting deflation. Now, deflation is when prices go down. This can be very bad for our society, some economists think, for various reasons. And the Fed lowered the Fed Fund's target rate to 1% to keep liquidity out there and avoid there being a deflation. Whether that was a real threat or not is hard to say. It worked. We didn't have a deflation, you could say that. But some people say that's what caused the excess liquidity that led to the housing bubble of a few years later. Continuing along in the early 2000s, we did avoid deflation. Now, in 2004, the Fed started to raise rates. This is when we had the famous conundrum. We were raising rates, but rates for mortgages and car loans and so on didn't move at all. Now, Alan Greenspan and people like Ben Bernanke also would say, oh, it's because of a world savings glut. So it didn't matter what the Fed did in the short market. In the long market, uh, people were there to lend money. Now, of course, all along there are people voicing that there's a housing bubble, but the Fed had pretty much renounced any role to prick a bubble. And everybody was hailing the success in the housing market, that home ownership rates had gone from 62% in the economy to 69%. The Clinton administration had liked it. The Bush administration had liked it. Alan Greenspan had talked favorably, favorably about it. People talked favorably about innovations in housing finance. Now, when Greenspan retires in 2005, he's hailed as the greatest central banker of all time at that time. A couple of years later, his legacy is greatly diminished. But at that time, there were no acute problems in the economy, so he got credit for being successful. To summarize, the Fed in the last 20 years fought inflation, fought deflation, fought asset price inflation. It fought them all, but not really consistently. The underlying economy always seemed to be the dominating factor. For example, the impact of housing prices was never easy to put bounds on. When the prices went down, we didn't realize it could be that bad. Uh, policy effects were always subject to long and variable lags and then just magnitude issues. Now, the policy in 2007-2008 being done by Ben Bernanke is completely different from that of the Greenspan years, and we'll get to that later.